So thank you all for joining us today. We have a lot of people signed up. We had about 80 people. Um, today's webinar is uh, part of the Do Networks series, Dialogues in Disability Pride and Culture, Organizing Within an Intersectional Framework. And um, we're really happy to have a couple of great speakers today who put together an awesome webinar presentation for us. And so um, with that, I want to introduce you to Catherine Enriquez Perez and Lenore Vanek, who, and who can introduce yourselves and get us started. And if you need me to move the slides, um, just tell me next slide. Sure, we can move on to the next slide. Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Perez. And I originally am from Whittier and La Mirada, California area. area. Um, although currently I'm residing in, Cal uh, in Chicago, where I'm a doctoral candidate in disability studies. So I'm um, soon to be a, a PhD. I also have my JD from the UCLA School of Law, where I specialize in critical race theory. And I use she, her, and hers pronouns. Hi, I'm Lenore Vanek. I'm a PhD candidate in urban planning, so my research is looking at marginalized populations across the lifespan, specifically looking at people with uh, physical disabilities as a proxy for aging. Um, I am uh, a sibling, so I have a sister with Down syndrome, uh, and uh, I'm part of the co-founder for CNLD and also co-founder for Latino Disability Foundation and Forum. And I, lastly, I do a lot of uh, evaluation on nonprofit, especially as it relates to disability and integration. Right. And I think you said you're a sibling. I'm also a sibling. I have a, a sister with intellectual disability. She's a year younger than me. And both Lenore and I also identify as disabled Latinas. And like she said, we're both co-founders of the National Coalition for Latinas with Disabilities, which is what you see on the bottom right corner is our little insignia. CNLD is our um, Spanish. Um, acronym. So we can go to the next slide now. So today uh, we're going to be doing a few different activities and the goal with these activities is to consider how organizing with an intersectional framework shapes our work. We're going to assess our knowledge and our practice of reaching out to and working effectively with individuals with multiply marginalized identities and what that even means. We're going to deconstruct common stereotypes together. And we're going to build on our individual and organizational capacities to work within inclusive frameworks. So we're going to turn and talk about four different concepts. The intersectionality, multiple sites of oppression, decolizing disability, racism, misogynist, and cis-heteronormative. And so our agenda is as follows. We're going to be defining different concepts. We're going to be doing two activities. One is the identity wheel which is an individual project, and then deconstructing um, stereotype, which is kind of a group discussion. And then we really want to start looking at how do we start building resources, resources that you have, but also provide you with resources um, that we found as well. You can go to the next slide. Uh, one back. Thank you. So when we're looking at intersectionality, it's defined, um, it's a term coined by an American feminist legal scholar, critical race theorist, and civil rights advocate Kimberly William Crenshaw to describe the overlapping and intersecting social identities related systems of oppression, domination, or discrimination. So intersectionality is this idea that there are multiple identities that intersect or cross over to create a person, a whole, that is different from different component identities. So there's different aspects of identity that's not just unitary, but it's mutually exclusive entities. But it's also reciprocal, constructing phenomena. So it, really important is intersectionality, especially now where we are in our history and our politics, is dynamic. Um, and it's constantly changing. Yeah, I, when I think of intersectionality, I think of like an intersection at a road, right? So. Um, we have all these different roles, all these different identities that define us. You know, I'm a woman, I'm Latina, I have a disability, um, you know, I'm heterosexual, you know, all these different, um, not religious, and the intersection of all of these roads um, makes up uh, my intersecting identity. So intersectionality is about identity. So 
moving on to multiple sites of oppression. So intersectionality isn't simply a view of a person's identity, but it's rather an overarching analysis of power hierarchy, which is present within identities. So there's framework of intersectionality, also provides insight into how multiple systems of oppression are interrelated. Are in, are interrelated. Sorry about that. Are interrelated um, and are interactive. Um, and so when we start looking at multiple sites of oppression, that was my sister, by the way, um, we have um, racism or white supremacy, sexism um, or patriarchy. When we start looking at gender, it's cis sexism or gender and oppression. When we start looking at sexual orientation, it's heterosexism. Under class, it's classism. So we're really looking at all of the isms. You know, ability, disability, it's the ableism, age, it's the ageism, adultism, religion, it's religious oppression. Um, and so, and for race, it's racism or white supremacy. Um, and so, those are, I really apologize. Do not mute. Um, it is. So, so intersectionality has to do with um, the identity of the individual, and then when you, you have an individual with intersecting identities, they face a system of multiple sites of oppression. So those two concepts are sort of interrelated in that way. So if I am a female Latina with a disability, um, I will face sexism, uh, you know, the, the patriarchy, um, ableism, um, and, and racist structures. Um, and now moving on to decolonizing disability. Um, this is a concept, I think a lot of these are, are pretty academic, but we're, we're sort of trying to break them down so you can apply them in the work that you do. Um, but when I think about decolonizing disability, particularly from an academic standpoint, it's something that we talk a lot about in disability studies and academic world of how the disability industrial concept, uh, I'm sorry, complex, the disability industrial complex, which is sort of all the people who work within the area of disability or self-included who work at independent living centers, academics such as ourselves who do research on disability, how we focus on disability being sort of a northern hemisphere, you know, white, middle-aged, male, you know, heteronormative sort of, uh, this is a typical disabled person that we think about as we provide services, as we do research, and as we uh, construct anything that has to do uh, with, with disability, including the media, which I think we wanted to talk about a little later. Um, so that also bleeds into um, the next part. But, but, well, well, the idea of decolonizing disability, too, I should say, is not just the negative stuff. The good part is that a lot of people are working on decolonizing disability, such as um, the Dunn Network class is to come speak, and that is doing trainings like this and considering um, people who sit on the margins of already in a marginalized identity, which is disability. And um, you know, those are people of different races and classes. And in a more academic sense, too, it's also uh, particularly, especially with the colonizing bit, um, not only defining disability or thinking about disability as like a US or northern hemisphere concept, but um, also including, quote unquote, the global south um, when we think about who is disabled and, and, our, and included in our community um, writ large. Did you want to say something? Nope. Just, just touched upon it. Yeah, I caught it. <laughs> okay. Um, so race is misogynist, cis heteronormative. Um, you can add more to that. You know, we have ableist, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think we're just sort of, you know, beating this point home because all these things are interrelated. Um, we just want to point out that these, this is the standard, this is sort of the default world that we live in. Um, you know, and, and because we have the mic, you, you guys can't really argue with us right now, but, um, you know, I, I posit that this is, this is the norm, this is the world that we live in, and these are the prevalent ideologies. Um, so racist, I think I don't really have to define, misogynist, um, and unpatriarchal, which is, um, you know, favoring men and, 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 you know, providing unequal rights to women, and then uh, I think cis heteronormative is, are, is is sort of a word that, that's new for a lot of people. And cis has to do with um, cisgender. And that is whether, um, if you're cisgendered, that is your gender expression matches um, 
the, the sex that you were born with. So, um, you know, the sex organs match the way you express your gender. Um, so, so if you're not cisgender, then I guess you would be trans. Um, and then heteronormative has to do with um, uh, a male and a female couple, right? So, um, you know, when, when we see constantly in the media and Hollywood, we only see the male and the female, you know, couple. Um, that's sort of this heteronormative society that we live in. So we can go to the next slide now that we've defined all these terms. And if there is a way that you guys, I, I didn't ask this before to Ted who organized this, but if there's ways for you guys to ask questions throughout, like we're more than happy to take questions if that's through the chat box or yeah, however you want. Or if you can open the mic up in a, in a couple of minutes. So what are the exercises that we have? Catherine, yes, Catherine, just really, yes. really quickly, this is Ted. I am moderating um, the webinar platform, so if folks have questions, just use the raise your hand function and um, raise your hand and then I'll alert Catherine or Lenore um, that there's a question out there. Perfect, perfect. perfect. Okay, but we'll, just, we'll keep going for now until we see some of these questions popping up. And we're going to move on to our exercise, which is the identity wheel. And Ted, can you confirm that everyone either has a, a page with a circle on it or, um, or has the ability to sort of do this project with us? Yeah, we sent, um, we sent this out with the materials and the confirmation. Um, so folks should be able to have printed it out or they could, um, they could be drawing this right now as we're doing the okay. exercise. And if folks not, here in the room are doing yeah, and if you can't do it right now, you can do it. You know, you can think about the activity or you can um, learn how to do it here and then apply it, you know, at some point in the future. And I'm sorry, Lenore's going to explain the project. So we're taking the identity wheel, which we're using from the curriculum Teaching for Diversity and Social Justice. And so real quickly, if, if you just want to draw a circle or you just grab a couple of pennies um, or whatever you have, and I want you to kind of uh, envision a piece of a pie and you're cutting pie for certain people. And I want you to think of people in the following context of categories. Um, race, sex, gender, religion, class, ability, sexual orientation, age, and other. And so I want you to kind of divide this identity wheel up um, on what you think as it relates to race, wh where you're at. If you're a female or if you're a male, um, for well, sex, for race, it's, you know, if you're Caucasian, Asian, Black, um, Latinx, Latin, Lat Latino X, and, you know, I want to interpose um, ethnicity on there, which usually is another conversation we can have for another webinar for that, um, and kind of draw your own pieces of the pie and kind of parcel it out. And if you can take a couple of minutes to do that, um, and then I want you to go back after you've labeled each section, and I want you to kind of, you know, uh, tell us what type of um, a group category it is. you belong to, yes. whether it's advantaged or targeted group. Um, so, for example, um, some people can say that uh, that women are a targeted group. So, if you're a woman, you would put T under woman. Um, or you might even take it further and say you're a cis woman, so maybe you're advantaged in that way. Um, you know, and if, you, and if you're a man, then you would put that, you're in an advantage group for that. And then the way that pi is a portion is, is sort of uh, in a way that reflects your awareness of the social group membership that you, that you identify with. So um, we'll give you a minute, and, and while we're talking still, you guys can, can be doing this activity, um, either writing it or thinking it, thinking it through. Um, and it's really important. Um, so this identity wheel can be done as an individual. And so when it's, when this identity wheel has been used before, it's done by the individual. You can do it as a group. So if you're doing team building exercises to try to figure out where you are, um, or it can be done at a nonprofit status. And it's always nice to kind of take a look and see where your identity has shifted. Um, usually six months, nine months, one year. And then when, and if you see it as a group that there are certain areas that are targeted um, and, and you're looking at targeted as being disadvantaged, 
then how do you as a group kind of work towards trying to overcome uh, that, that targeted um, issue or issues that you might have under conversation? And very important, the identity wheel is supposed to be a safe space to have these discussions. And over time, they may change because there's externalities that we're looking at where we have policy right now, both at the local level, at the national level, and also at the global level. Um, that are interacting with a lot of the ways that we're self-identing ourselves, especially with different intersectionalities and a lot of this being defined right now by public policy going into law. And so as you guys are doing this, I'll sort of just go over some of the categories um, that we can think about in terms of uh, which ones are advantaged and which ones are, are targeted social categories. So under race, um, I would put the privileged or the advantaged social group as, as white or um, when we're teaching Caucasian. Um, and then I would say the targeted social groups are people of color, Native Americans, Black, Asian, Latino, Pacific Islanders. Um, for sex, again, I already talked about that one that uh, you can either say the, the advantage is male, um, male, or uh, you might even you might even think that you as a cis uh, female, um, well, I guess that's, that's gender. So sex male definitely is the advantage. And then uh, for the targeted social groups, that would be a female, um, someone who's transsexual, and then intersex individuals. And then for gender, like I was saying, um, if you're cis gendered, um, then you are in the advantaged group. And then if um, you know, if you're gender ambiguous, if you're transgender, gender queer, gender nonconforming, or gender fluid, then you would be more in a targeted group. And then sexual orientation, heterosexual, uh, puts you in an advantage category, and being uh, bisexual, lesbian, gay, pansexual, asexual, or queer, um, puts you in the targeted group. And then class, if you're rich or upper class, you would be an advantage. And then the working class, um, economically poor people, even middle, some middle class statuses would be in the targeted group. Um, and then I, I don't really know how I feel about ability being the, the, the overall word for the category, but um, your status is being non-disabled or disabled. So I would say if you're non-disabled, you, you're advantaged, and if you're um, disabled, you're in the targeted group. And Lenore and I were talking about this yesterday, and we're like, wow, we can actually take this activity even further because um, these are sort of broad categories, but then as you were saying with ethnicity, you know, we can even cut these categories even deeper, right? So disability, um, particularly in the, in the academic work that we do, there's even hierarchies within disability, right? So um, you might say that someone with a physical disability is sort of on a higher, on a higher plane uh, of, I don't want to say advantage, but advantaged over um, someone maybe with intellectual disability. Um, so really, this, this is just to get you thinking about, like, in what ways are you advantaged, in what ways are you part of the targeted groups. Um, and then and we will give you just another minute, and then we will move on. Um, but before we move on, um, we kind of wanted, I again, Tim could answer if you guys are all present in the same room. It seems to me that that you might be in separate spaces, but if, if there's anyone who are in the the same room with each other and want to share how this activity made you feel or, or sort of reflect on the activity, we'll also give you a couple minutes to share with each other about that. Um, so uh, Catherine, this is Ted. Um, we have about 11 or 12 people who are in the room together here um, for our meeting and then Folks are joining separately from around the country. So um, we do have one question from in the room from the exercise. Okay. Cindy. Fantastic. Come up here. Just uh, getting closer to the polycom. My question is the categories that you have listed up there. I mean, there's really no end to categories, are there? Or is this just can't be just this? There is no end. You're, you're correct. These are just initial categories that have that help stir up and these are the most common uh, categories but you can actually add more um, right I was thinking yeah. so that's why that's why it says other 
And basically, I mean, it's up to you to apportion how big the slices are, and that is sort of how you identify with, with each one. So for this example that we have on the right, um, you can see that this person's identity as a black person is sort of uh, like a bigger part of their identity in their life. And then being a woman, being Christian, being working class, being a young adult are also sort of like the bigger things that, that they identify with, right? So um, it's thinking about, um, you know, the multiple ways that we that we identify and 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 how we sort of talk about hierarchies, um, how we apportion what the, what those identities mean to us. You know how connected we are to social groups within um, race or disability, or or how often you know a lot of times with if we're in an advantaged group, I would say a lot of times the advantaged groups we don't really think about those groups very often because we don't you know we don't think about our privilege very often, right? So we don't. If, for example, you're non-disabled, um, you know, this might be a smaller piece of the pie because it's something you don't really think about very often, right? Whereas if someone is disabled, this might be a very large slice of the pie for someone because, um, you know, they're, they're, every day they're socially aware of their status as someone with a disability. So unless there's another question, I think we'll move on. And um, hopefully you guys can, um, you know, take your identity well. I know they're very personal. And um, you know, continue to do this practice with with um, yourself and with your organizations and other people you come in contact with. So we can move on to the next slide. Okay, uh, really quickly, we just have one more question, and I'm going to read it from the chat box. Perfect. Uh, the person says they're they're wondering um, about ability being used as the title of the category, and wondering um, what you would write instead: um, disabled or non-disabled. Is there a different way to write yeah, that? Yeah, I think that's right. Order? Yeah, so because um, this is copyrighted, um, I didn't amend the way it's written. And um, as, you, as you can see on the slide, um, it's from Teaching for Diversity and Social Justice, um, so uh, from a book, uh, textbook. Um, but I, I think I did mention this, right? I, I'm, I, don't, I don't really feel good about um, the term. The term ability. Which kind of like harkens to, it's funny, when we list different categories, I feel like I'm going to sneeze, um, or identity categories or when we list oppression, you know, I always feel like disability is kind of like the last one people list or don't ever list. And ableism is something that people don't list, you know, or it's the last one being listed. And I think, um, you know, the fact that it's including here is good, but um, it also shows how you know, and this was done in what 2007. Um, this chart, how um, how much more work we have to do with the disability community to advocate that our identity category gets placed in there in the verbiage that we want, and that our you know our oppression, which is ableism, is included when people list categories of oppression. When people are saying racism, sexism, you know. Um, transphobia, that ableism gets included in that as well. And I agree with the person who, who wrote that comment that I would probably put, um, you know, maybe like, are you disabled or non-disabled or your disability category. Um, so the next part is deconstructing stereotypes. And for you, are I going to explain that? You. Okay. Um, so this was sort of a group discussion. Um, so I think for some people who are in the room will be able to um, speak and then other people will be able to um, type in um, their experiences. Um, we thought this would be fun to sort of uh, think about and assess individually and just from our own um, organizations that we come from. Um, some of the misconceptions, some of the stereotypes, some of the, the ways that we work on defaults um, that are exclusive of taking into account the multiple identities that individuals possess and these multiple sites of oppression that people face. And uh, we're just going to start with a really quick example um, to let you guys know how we want to how we want to talk about this. And do you want me to give it or do you want to give so it? When we, so right now with everything that's happening, the stereotype that we constantly keep mm -hmm. um, having to debate and discuss is that the definition of or the topic of immigrants are Latino, or all immigrants are Latino. And so there seems to be this misconception of, of where you are. Again, re very important, stereotypes happen to be place-based. So in the Midwest where we're located at, you know, for us, immigrants are 
not only Latino, but you know, for us in the Midwest, it's immigrants are Mexican. But even within Latino, there are Peruvian, Chilean, um, uh, Mexican, um, Colombianos, the different types of individuals that make up this big umbrella of Latinoness. So immigrants, you know, from South America um, is usually categorized and always identified as Mexican, but then there's also the Eastern Europeans that we that that we find are the immigrants from um, the Asian countries that are that are starting to come that are currently being persecuted. So that one is probably the easiest one that we started to yeah to kind of the most salient and obvious one for particularly this time um, with everything that was going on with DACA, um, especially for our organization as the National Coalition for Latinx with Disabilities. We got a lot of requests to talk about DACA and we get a lot of requests to talk about immigration. Um, you know, and I've been on panels with other people who, who are very good about pointing out that the immigrant community is not only um, the Mexican population and so that's good to keep in mind. Um, and even further than that, you know, uh, especially with our group, the National Coalition for Latinx with Disabilities, when we talk about immigration issues as well, um, we not only consider um, Latinxes who are immigrants, but um, we also consider, and, and the racism or the xenophobia that they face, we also consider disabled Latinxes, which is sort of bringing this idea of intersectionality. Um, so when we think of the immigration policies or immigration debate, um, we, we complicate what those policy issues are because we think we're thinking about um, immigrants with disabilities and how these multiple systems of oppression, which is you know xenophobia, racism, and nationalism, um, intersect with ableism and, and create particular problems for immigrants who have disabilities. Um, so for for example, like a really quick example was like with DACA. For example, some individuals, um, I did a bunch of interviews with a lot of um, individuals from, who were documented um, and, and disabled. And one person was telling me they have a learning disability and they actually had DACA, but, uh, which is essentially a, um, a work permit, um, if, if you don't know what DACA is. And even though they were privileged to get the, the work permit, and privileged I mean like in a legal sense, you know, um, we can debate that, how privileged that is. Um, they still weren't able to find a job because they still confronted a system of ableism where people don't hire people with learning disabilities or with disabilities generally, right? So um, again, we're considering all these multiple intersections. So I don't see anyone typing anything about um, ster common stereotypes or misconceptions or uh, problems that they run into that do not take intersectional identities into account. So we'll just go on to another example. Um, unless someone also in the room wants to provide an example. Another common one that I thought about is, um, you know, when we think about children, and for those of you who work with children, um, is, is this notion that, you know, everyone who presents as a little girl, and this is an easy, obvious one that we talk about, I think, more and more in, in society, you know, when we see a little girl, we tend to gender them, we tend to um, give them pink toys, pink balloons, pink stickers, you know, and then when we see a little boy, you know, it's all about blue. Um, we have uh, different ways that, that we talk with, and there's a lot of studies that, that sort of confirm this, that we talk to um, little girls versus little boys, um, and, and also where we assume, we assume um, people's genders, um, not only for children, but for adults as well. Um, so, um, again, so we sort have, of deconstructing. Uh, Catherine, we have someone in the room who wanted to give a, a common stereotype example. Uh, my hi. example is, um, hi, my name is Jeanette. Um, my example hi, Jeanette. is a uh, person with a disability who has a PCA. All the time I see people address that PCA first, PCA is personal care attendant, um, mm -hmm. in, in the assumption that that person cannot uh, function individually. Um, one right. For human confidence. I went shopping right. with my friend who is physically impaired and it was her credit card that she was buying and the uh, 
the cashier said, looked at me and said, can she sign this? And I was a little rude because I said, I hope she can. She's blind, not stupid, and it's her card. So um, that's, that's what I have. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I think that that's a stereotype that disabled people are just incompetent, right? Mm -hmm. And and so one thing I you know we typically say is you know you should always presume competence when you're speaking to someone with a disability. And a really good example is my sister who has Down syndrome. She's 47 years young, and I am her legal guardian. And and it was a very very difficult decision to become her legal guardian, but for our financial protectiveness, we needed to go that route. So usually, when Mary will say, you know. You know, this is my sister, and she's legal guardian with me. And everyone always tries to correct her and says, "Oh no, she's your legal guardian." And she's like, "No, she's legal guardian with me." And the key operating word is the word "with." So we constantly, and Mary educates people, it's like, "No, she's my legal guardian." But we talk, we discuss, and I think that throws a lot of people back that you know I'm making the decision when completely contrary. You know, it becomes a, a discussion and. Even from the Down syndrome population, you know, uh, even though Mary operates at a second grade level, you know, her interaction is completely different. And when we're starting to take a look at deconstructing different types of stereotypes, we're also now seeing a lot of TV and a lot of movies starting to address people with disabilities. Um, you have Speechless that, you know, uh, is being played by an actor who is white um, and the symbolic of being in a in, in a wheelchair, and that kind of, you know, taking the first step of introducing disability from a different perspective, or you had Corky um, in the 1980s, a young boy with Down syndrome, or you had um, all these other um, different shows, and yesterday I watched The Good Doctor for the first time, you know, again, privileged white male, um, white autistic, you know, um, which, you know, light it up blue, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, again, I think the point, Lenore, that you're making, and you're making it well, I'm just reiterating it, is that um, a lot of a lot of stereotypes or um, uh, the default that we go to when we think about disability is a white male, um, which is very prevalent when we look at media, when we look at Hollywood. But that is typically how we are represented as disabled individuals as white males. So for a lot of us, for me, for example, as a Latina with a disability, you know, I don't see myself. Um, reflected and well in the media. And um, just to wrap up this this group discussion that we're having, um, I think the point is is that you know we need we need to be very cognizant of the stereotypes um, on the, the preconceived notions that we have when we interact with people and realize that people come from you know all different walks of life and people have you know multiply marginalized identities and identify in very different ways and come from very different lived experiences and that we shouldn't make any assumptions about any individual when we, when we work with them, right? Um, and so we can move on now to the next slide because I think we're actually out of time, but if you'll give us another five minutes, we can probably try to wrap up really quickly if that's okay, Jen. Of course, of course. We have, we have a little bit more time, so just keep going. Okay, yeah, and so I'm reading the comments from Mary right now with, you know, uh, regarding speechless and what struck her was seeing how the first time a person with a disability as funny and the stereotype is that people with disabilities aren't intellectually capable of humor. And that really is a fantastic example. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think, you know, as we start looking at media and we start looking at the um, society starting to embrace people um, because we're having a very big difficult uh, time in the next 15 years where we're going to have the largest population will be elderly and we're not physically prepared from our cities from, you know, from a planning perspective that we're going, I, I predict that we're going to start seeing people start to so soften up and kind of change their views on the different types of stereotypes that are, that are occurring. Um, so when we start looking at um, different uh, resources. Um, we've got four that we kind of just started very quickly. Uh, and actually, I mean, one thing that I want to point out, um, as we were, you know, we did like a really quick Google and a search. I mean, there's tons of information out there about intersectionality. I mean, it's a very, uh, has its academic beginnings, as Lenore said, and we're very, um, uh, you know, proud to credit that intersectionality is a term that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and 
in the black feminist movement. And Kimberly Crenshaw, um, she was actually my professor at UCLA Law, um, one of my professors. Um, you know, she came up with this because in the law, you know, you can you can have an action for uh, being discriminated against for being a woman, and you can have an action for being discriminated against uh, for being black. But what she was saying was, um, well, no, uh, black women face a particular type of discrimination that black men don't face, or that white women don't face. So why can't we um, have a, a cause of action for um, this intersectional category? And that's sort of where. The term was coined, but certainly not the experience, because um, you know the idea of intersectionality and having intersectional identities, which just has always has always existed. Um, so it's very much academic things what I'm trying to say, but we're, we try to keep it down um, to non-academic stuff. And when you look at um, the work that people in the disability community are doing with intersectionality, um, you'll see just the fact that there's only a few links here that it really is sort of an emerging area, and I think. Uh, this is not uh, endemic to disability. I think that intersectionality is sort of kind of just taking hold within all sorts of rights movements. Um, I think that our rights movements have uh, sort of been fractured. You know, the you know, black civil rights movement has, has done their thing. The disability movement has done their own thing. LGBTQ, LGBTQ et cetera, et cetera. And now I think we know that the, the future of our civil rights movements necessarily has to be intersectional. And that we have to consider um, people with multiply marginalized identity within our own categories. Um, which is exactly what brought about the National Coalition for Latinx with Disabilities, which is a group that we co-founded a little over a year ago that we're very proud about. And um, you know, I think there's such a need um, for this type of intersectional work, um, and it's being evidenced in in the fact that we started this group about a year ago that it didn't exist, and that um, you know that already uh, there's pe people are asking us for so many speaking engagements and to. You know, I've I've been on the phone all week responding um, for the Puerto, Puerto Rico crisis and, and doing uh, media for people with disabilities in, in Puerto Rico and, and the disaster areas. Um, you know, we get asked to do webinars and talks, and we go to a lot of conferences now. And I think that there, it's just a representative of the need that we have within the disability community to really focus on disabled people of color. Um, you know, and then. And then, as you can imagine, there's so many other identities that that we don't do a good job of in the disability community of of, of thinking about and considering how these people fit within our community. Um, so, if you guys have a chance to go over these links, um, you know, these are some pretty good articles. Um, I know one of them is written by um, um, I have it here by Kay, Kaya Brown, um, and she is a black disabled woman. And you know it's really great. She talks about her experience while being a black disabled woman, and then she talks about Vilissa Thompson. And if you don't know Vilissa Thompson, she's uh, one of my um, one of my friends. She's a badass co-conspirator in the disability rights movement, and she's also the founder of the hashtag uh, hashtag Disability to White. Um, so if you're into that, if you're into like Twitter, Facebook hashtagging, you can look up hashtag Disability to White. Obviously, all one word, and you can see the discussion as to uh, what I was talking about previously, that, um, that the disability industrial complex doesn't consider um, uh, people with multiple identities in, in their policy making, in the, way we, in the way we organize our structures, in the way we organize our services um, to respond to, to diverse groups of people, in particular, in this case, by Melissa Thompson and Kara Brown, they're black disabled women who sort of started these efforts because they didn't see other black disabled women um, you know, and in the disability rights community or um, in disability services. And real quickly, I just want to address some of the uh, topics that just came out with respect to speechless or what's happening right now with the show and Netflix Atypical. Um, and I think it's very important to reiterate that, you know, these shows, even though they're trying to portray a person with a disability, they're, they're kind of putting these individuals in a box that actually allows for ratings to occur and not really telling the true story of, of uh, and the example on the question is of a young man with ASD who decides he wants to get a girlfriend. Um, again, I think there are a lot of myths that also need to be discussed, and I think you know the myths of disability is another uh, webinar that can be talked, and I'm sure you have many, many stories on on that. But again, you know, using you know um, TV right now as an opening door to start having discussions and as an educational piece I think is important. Realizing that what 
and who a person with a disability is being portrayed, really they aren't people with disabilities. They are able-bodied, privileged, white male Caucasians that are playing, you know, a person with a disability. And I think that's really important. But if we use that concept as a teaching in a teachable moment, I think, you know, we move, you know, the movement forward. Yeah. And I think you're responding to Tanya's comment in the chat box. I, I just read it really quickly. I don't watch Atypical, um, but I guess you're saying that um, the person with, um, with autism wants to get a girlfriend in this show. Um, and you're saying that, that like, the, the stereotype there that they're debunking is that all disabled people are asexual. And, you know, none of us want to have sex. None of us are capable of having sex. Like, oh my goodness, right? Um, and yeah, I think that's, that's super right on. I think that that's, that's sort of a stereotype and a general assumption that people have about people with disabilities. Um, and, but I, you know, I would, because well, even you say right here, get a girlfriend, and is it a he? It's a young man, exactly. So I would even take that further, that it, it is a good step that they're showing uh, someone with autism who, who is sexual, because that's, oh my goodness, that's, that's obvious, right? Um, but um, taking the step further, that is the default always going to be um, heteronormativity, right? So, so here we're, we're just breaking in with a disabled person who wants to get a girlfriend. This is a heteronormative couple. Um, so again, how can we push the boundaries to be inclusive of um, um, same, same gendered um, couples who are disabled, which is, adds other layers of oppression and other layers of intersectionality um, when we talk about people. But again, I guess it's a good start. Um, so, and the, last, the last one I didn't talk about was the Disability Visibility Project. That's the third link that we have there. And um, that is run by Alice Wong, um, another woman of color who um, has a disability. Um, so she, you know, like I said, Melissa Thompson, Kaya Brown, um, and now Alice Wong, and then I consider ourselves in the National Coalition for Latin Exclusive Disabilities for being uh, really great resources and individuals who are working on sort of intersectional is, um, intersectionality in the disability world. So um, definitely check us out and use us as resources and connect with us, join with us. Um, you know, we're pretty much a movement and um, our, our goal really is to disrupt um, the disability rights movement and to disrupt um, disability spaces and, um, you know, and, and, and make people consider that people with disabilities have multiple identities. And was someone speaking a second ago? Yeah, we have a question from within the room, and it comes from um, Cindy Soto from Los Angeles. Cindy asked me to read it, and that was, how do we get the different movements for social change to embrace and um, recognize and acknowledge intersectionality in their work? So it's really more of a functional question about how do we put this stuff into practice? And then as a second, part to that too is how do we, once, once they're doing that, how do we get them to recognize disability as one of those intersections? Yeah, that is a great question. And I, again, I, I feel like I keep tooting our horn with the National Coalition for Latin with Disabilities, but I'm very proud as a co-founder of the work we've been doing the past year. And that is, is we've identified uh, the leaders across the nation um, who are Latinos with disabilities who have sort of been working within their own silos and have felt like they're the only, you know, Latino in a completely white space of people with disabilities. And we've all connected, like Lenore and I, right? And we've just become family and we've, we've propped each other up as leaders within the community. And really, um, you know, now, uh, like my, my dear friend Conchita um, Hernandez in, in D.C., who does a lot of really great work, she's um, um, blind, um, a uh, blind individual from Mexico, um, you know, so we, we promote a lot of the work that she does, for example. She promotes a lot of work that I'm doing here in Chicago. Um, you know, Alexis Alvarez, who we have um, working out in the Bay Area, et cetera. So it really is, um, you know, making connections between uh, leaders who already exist out there and finding the leaders with, with intersectional identities and promoting them to leadership positions and putting them into leadership positions. And again, like I said, I was involved this week you know, in a lot of discussions with disability rights leaders. And again, I was one of the only people of color in, in a room, you know, talking about disability issues. So once, once we get these leaders of color into these spaces, and not only leaders of color, but also like trans leaders and, uh, you know, people with, with multiple identities, right, into these spaces, and that's, that's how we're going to get our, our issues you know, represented. And I think, you know, having this webinar was 
the first step. So thank you very much, Ted, for inviting us and being able to have these discussions. And I always, you know, constantly keep going back with teachable moments. You know, what can become a teachable moment? But we also nationally, you know, and again, we're both promoting CNLD, but we also have conference calls, you know, that we have. And we invite everybody to, you know, to be part of this because it really is, um, at the end of the day, it really is, you know, the issue at the bottom line is, you know, is the structure of humanity and how do we go forward in, in, in a livable world. And, and how do we allow for different multiple uh, individual com complexes to come out in a safe space because we are all as individuals, we are all complex, we have multiple layers and so how do we kind of go forward with that and it really is just starting a small discussion and asking for, you know, it, you know just comments and, and feedback in a safe space. So thank you for, you know, allowing us to be yes, part of you. this. And I thought of one other thing, because I think I bashed the disability community a little too much. Um, but we also work on the other side as well. So we feel like we're a bridge between the disability community, who we feel needs to do a better job at uh, promoting diversity within their leadership and reaching out to uh, people of color and um, people with multiply marginalized identities. Uh, but we also see ourselves as a bridge to the Latinx community and Latinx organizations. And this goes back to that question, you know, how do we get multiple civil rights organizations to sort of work together and then and think about and include disability in their work. So I have done uh, training such as this one at Latinx organizations who I feel have done a really poor job of reaching out to their um, disabled um, constituents within their, within their group. Um, and we need to wrap up. Oh, we need to wrap up. I'm yeah. being told. Um, so, so also, um, again, it's, 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 you know, we're everyone right here is in the disability world, but we need to make sure that you know we're not just all talking to each other in the disability space, and that we're branching out. Um, just one more quick example too. There's this really great um, trans Latina organization here, and well, there's the national trans Latina organization, but there's a really great chapter in Chicago, and I've I've reached out to them and started doing work with them in terms of. Um, identifying trans Latinas with disabilities. So again, it's about coalition building. It's about working together um, and, and moving forward. And someone had a question. Yes. We've talked, we've talked. Uh, who are some Afro Latinx disability leaders? Um, so we have um, a few Afro Latinx disability leaders who are co-founders in our group: um, Lisa Torres, Gerald, Washika Torres, um, uh, este, um, se me olvida su nombre, pero um, we have a few great people, so check out our website. Um, and, then, and, 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 I, and I, I also want to admit too that you know, as you see, Lenore and I were you know we're light skin Latinas, and I don't think that's it's an accident. I do believe that colorism is a real big thing, and the fact that you know that I you know went through law school, I'm getting my PhD, that I you know I I am privileged, and my slice of my pie, you know, being light skin Latina, I think has afforded me more privileges than other people from my Latinx um, uh, community. Uh, particularly my Afro Latinx brothers and sisters. And then <laughs> lastly, um, so do either do either of us speak publicly at organizations? If, and yeah, and we actually do. And if we can't do it, we find someone else within our network to be able to represent. So I think as we're starting to identify, because again, you know, Latinx, you know, CNLD, it, we are a, a very emerging, you know, I, you know, um, organization that are starting that we are giving people safe space and we're also promoting other individuals which is something really important for us, you know, to be able because again we're only as strong as our, you know, that old adage, we're only as strong as our weakest link. Um, so any assistance that we can give you, please feel free to reach out to any of us, you know, um, by all means by, you know, email or by text or whatnot. Um, and Ted can give us, you know, um, can give us, give our uh, personal cell phone numbers out to you guys if, if need be. So thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to do the webinar with us. Um, today's webinar will be recorded and in a couple weeks we'll put it up online and we'll burn the captions on so it will have open captions. Um, and we'll also um, probably we'll send an announcement out when it's up online um, with these links that are in the webinar as well so that folks can um, get some follow-up resources. Um, we do need to wrap up um, because we're out of time, but again, um, Catherine and Lenore, I want to thank you so much from the Do Network and hopefully um, we can do some work together in the future.
Yes. Yes. We're excited about future collaborations and um, good luck to all of you out there in the work that you're doing.